This is Africa News Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello and welcome. Welcome to VOA Africa. Thank you for joining us. I'm Yehia Suhib in Washington. Here's what's coming up on African News Tonight. Sometimes we even switch from your patients without any anesthesia because we don't have it. That's Dr. Rashid Mokhtar, a Sudanese volunteer medical worker, describing the dire conditions at hospitals as the war drags on. Details coming up. Also, at least 12 people have died in Republic of Congo from three simultaneous epidemics. And eight migrants were found dead after a boat capsized off the coast of northern Senegal. These stories and more on African News Tonight. We start with our top story. Intense fighting continues in Sudan's capital, Khartoum, between the army and the paramilitary rapid support forces as the two one-time allies gear up to resume talks in the Saudi town of Jeddah. VOA's Nabil Biajo spoke with Dr. Rashid Mokhtar, a humanitarian worker volunteering in Amdurman, who shed light on the dire humanitarian situation for those caught in the crossfire with transportation and basic services breaking down due to the escalating conflict. All of this happening now is related to the negotiation taking place in Jeddah as uh, every side are trying to make a success in the ground in order to have a, a better place in the negotiation taking place in Jeddah. Unfortunately, they attacked a military hospital last week by drones uh, with too many casualties and deaths. Like two days later, they attacked a hospital called Alia Hospital. It's the private sector of the military hospital itself, uh, with drones as well. So yeah, now even uh, no hospital are dealing with the army injured people, the injured people from the army. Fighting between the army and the rapid support forces is in its fourth uh, month now. This is the fourth month of intense fighting. When I spoke with you last yeah. month, you painted a very dire humanitarian situation with uh, healthcare being on the verge of collapse. Now, one month later, I cannot imagine how things are now with fighting persisting. They are much more worse. Maybe you hear that uh, we have um, a obstetric hospital called the Saudi. It's not far from El Nau Hospital. And uh, one of the fights actually was taking place over there. And they had to, to move to, to be with us in, in no hospital. So now most of the people in the area controlled by the army in Perry are the people who are taking we, we can take care of. So now they merge together, two hospitals together, a Saudi hospital and a no hospital on the same place. And you can imagine how many patients or pregnant women we, we receive per day. It's too much, you know. And we also uh, received reports of intense fighting over the past few days in Umbadda Sabil. Do you go into that yeah. area? Do you do work there? We are not able to get in there. We are not able even to take a permission to get in there. We are not completely safe to get in there. And you know, as, as we as doctors, we, we can't put our safety in danger. That's why we just left it with the guys over there in Umbadda, our colleagues. We're trying to manage uh, some injuries to get into a no hospital, which is very difficult. We use Facebook accounts, we use Facebook pages to announce that we've got an injured patient in Umbadza who is supposed to come to a no hospital. And uh, we just ask people if they can get, us, get the patient from there. But it's very difficult, I'm telling you. Some patients actually, they arrive to the hospital or invite. Speaking of people unable to get to the health facilities, I was chatting with you earlier and you told me you were going out to see patients who cannot make it to the hospital. We know that the fighting yeah. has disrupted transportation and cars are not safe to move on the roads, bullets are flying. How are you able to help patients who are desperate for life-saving medical care, including gunshot wounds, when they can't even get, get to the hospital? All I can do is stabilize the wound, trying to stop the bleeding, and then they should go to the hospital to have proper management over there. I'm dealing mainly with people that uh, with a medical condition that they can't get there to the hospital, either uh, old people, either patients with like some strokes, some diabetic people, 
these people I can manage to to help them in their places, trying to give them some medications, some antibiotics, uh, checking their blood pressure. But you lose patience sometimes. How can anyone help uh, right now? What do you need the most to be able to help people? Transportation, safe, safe line of transportation. Like uh, you need to convince both sides, both fighting sides that uh, they uh, exclude patients to get in to, to get the proper treatment that they deserve. These are on the first hand. The second thing is, as we urge all of the uh, international organizations to support the hospitals with medical equipment, medications, supplies, consumables, everything that they can, because I'm telling you, sometimes we even torture some injured patients without any anesthesia because we don't have it. That was Dr. Rashid Mokhtar, a Sudanese volunteer medical worker who spoke with VOA's Nabil Biyajo from Omdurman. The Republic of Congo is suffering outbreaks of three different diseases that have killed at least 12 people in Dolisie, the country's third largest city. Nearly 1,700 suspected cases have been reported in three hospitals in the city, and deaths also have been recorded in Ponte Noir, Madingo, and Brazzaville. Rossi Piot has details in Brazzaville. The Republic of Congo's government has urged the population to be vigilant and observe specific Asian holes while assuring that it is working to contain the outbreaks of shigellosis, cholera, and typhoid fever. Gilbert Mokoki, Minister of Health. He says that Face à cette situation, departments not experiencing epidemics must be on the alert. He assures the population that the staff of the Ministry of Health and Population is hard at work to bring these epidemics under control. The symptoms of the disease are the same. Abdominal pain, vomiting, eye fever, broody diarrhea, and general asthenia. In Dolizi, capital of the Niari department, medical staff and the general public are on alert. Tony Jack is resident of Dolizi. He says that he knows how to protect himself by washing his hands with soap, bleach, condition at home, not taking water from the pump. In accordance with international health regulations, to which the Congo is a signatory, health authorities have declared the three epidemics and medical aid has already begun arriving in Dolisi. For VOA News, I'm Rosie Piot in Brazzaville. Eight migrants were found dead after a boat capsized off the coast of northern Senegal as it tried to reach Europe. Interior Minister Felix Abdullaye says the bodies were recovered by the fire department and the Navy and a search for survivors has been launched. Murtal Ambaye, the director of the morgue in the northern fishing city of St. Louis, where the bodies were brought, told the Associated Press that about 155 people were on board. Many of the survivors are being treated for injuries. He said it is not clear how many people are still missing. The boat rescued Wednesday evening comes days after seven others were found dead and 50 were rescued on a different vessel, also bound for Europe and discovered off the coast of St. Louis. At least 90 people are feared missing from that boat. In Cameroon, authorities say separatists have set up roadblocks to at least 20 western districts to protest what they call excessive brutality by government troops. The rebels accused Cameroon's military in the past week of killing at least 27 people and burning scores of homes. Cameroon's military denies the allegations and blames separatists for the killing. Moki Edwin Kenzeka reports from Yaoundé, Cameroon. The northwest, one of two regions where separatists are active, produces maize, potatoes, beans, rice and other produce for Cameroon's major cities. Cattle from the region is sold throughout the country and markets in neighboring Nigeria. But government officials say thousands of people, especially merchants, are blocked from traveling into or out of the region. 
47-year-old Nembongam is coordinator of the network of maize farmers in the Boyo district. Nembo says fighters set up roadblocks to at least 20 districts this week and are threatening to kill merchants who defy a separatist ban on the movement of goods and people. There is no means in which products can leave the villages to towns with the block of the roads. The effect is that we, the masses, are in trouble because prices of basic food commodities have risen. We are begging and pleading for the government to see what they can do because the blocking of the roads, it's a hard pill to swallow. Speaking via a messaging app, Nembo said the affected districts are running short of basic commodities imported either from or through Nigeria or Cameroon's economic capital, Douala. He said there has been a 60% increase in basic commodity prices. Fighters say they mounted roadblocks to stop the Central African state's military from touching homes and killing civilians. Separatists say government troops indiscriminately killed 27 people in the past week and either arrested or tortured scores of civilians accused of failing to inform the military of separatist fighters' whereabouts. Capo Daniel is leader of the Ambazonia People's Rights Advocacy Platform, one of Cameroon's separatist groups. He says the roadblocks will be removed when Cameroon government troops stop abusing civilians. Our fighters had to set up major roadblocks that have cut off a huge part of our rural areas from the Bamenda city center and the rest of the war, basically, to be able to carry out the operation targeting the Cameroon military so that our people can go back to their day-to-day -day life, which our fighters are fighting for. The military denies it indiscriminately arrests, tortures, and kills civilians and blames fighters for the past week's killings. The military says in one of the attacks, separatists disguised themselves as government troops to try to frame them for the killing of 10 civilians at Nacho Junction in Bamenda. Deben Chofor, the governor of Cameroon's northwest region, says government troops are attempting to track down and kill all fighters who refuse to drop their weapons and surrender. The armed forces work with professionalism, respecting human rights, but there are still some pocket of resistance. We have to mobilize the population to denounce those that are bringing havoc and disorder in our various communities. Rights groups, including Human Rights Watch, have accused both the military and rebels of abuses in Cameroon's separatist crisis. The English-speaking rebel groups have been trying to carve out an independent state from Cameroon and its French-speaking majority since 2017. The conflict has killed more than 6,000 people and displaced more than 760,000 others, according to the International Crisis Group. Moki Edwin Kinzuka for VOA News, Yaoundé, Cameroon. You're listening to African News Tonight on The Voice of America. Kenya is in the midst of anti-government protests led by the opposition political party over a contentious new finance bill and the rising cost of living. Dr. Edward Gistura is an international relations security and diplomacy expert at the United States International University in Nairobi. He tells me the opposition should have looked for better ways other than protests, which have turned very ugly. Dialogue should have been the preferred route. These protests, according to Dr. Edgar, are nothing more than economic sabotage that will eventually hurt the country. He has now come to the conclusion that opposition leader Raila Odinga is a sore loser. Okay, so the opposition has decided to stage protests, but from where I see it, I think the opposition are not being very fair because the government has only been in power for a few months, not even a year yet. And so they were trying, the president came in and he tried to bring in, to remove subsidies because Kenya was living in a very artificial economy with a lot of subsidies, subsidies in food, subsidies in fuel. So he removed the subsidies so that the economy could just, the market forces could balance out and Kenyans could understand the true cost of living, the actual cost of living. The subsidies were costing the government a lot of money. So when he withdrew the subsidies, that is when 
when now people started feeling this rising cost of living. But let me also say that even if it is the opposition that had been in power, the high cost of living would have still been experienced because the world is in a global recession. Economies are in a lot of recession in many parts of the world. The Russia-Ukraine war affecting the price of fuel and all this. So Kenya is really not unique. So my take is that, number one, the opposition should have looked for better ways other than protesting and, and the violent demonstrations that you people are seeing in the, in the media. They should have chosen the dialogue route, and they had already formed a committee to start dialoguing and stating exactly what they felt should be done. But somehow the talks collapsed, and that's why we are where we are. So you're saying it's too early. The government has not been given a chance to kind of uh, advance its policies. It needs more time. Ex that is basically what you're saying. Ex exactly. Because, for example, if I'm to be specific, like in the food sector, in the food security sector, what they did, the government brought in a lot of subsidized fertilizer so that farmers could access fertilizer cheaply, so that the cost of inputs for agricultural produce could be cheaper, so that eventually when the maize, when we get our staple food, Kenyan staple food is maize and cereals and the grains. When we get the food, the farmers are able to sell the food cheaply in the market, and then that ensures food security and lowers the cost of living. But what has happened is that we haven't even started harvesting the, the, the food that was planted late last year, you know, and the opposition is already in the streets. And, and I know for a fact, having talked with colleagues who are experts in, um, in food security, when Kenya starts harvesting the maize, in the month of August, September this year, we're going to start seeing food prices coming down. Already, things like potatoes, some vegetables, tomatoes, the prices have already started coming down because of those subsidies in the agricultural sector. So like you've rightly put it, the government needed more time to settle down. They came and inherited a very huge debt. They're still trying to balance how to pay this external debt and pay their own internal obligations. So they, they, the government's plate was full. The current president came and found an economy riddled with debt, with a lot of issues, and he's been trying to solve them one by one. So the opposition parties, uh, in my view, uh, did not give the government time to settle down. And even then, whatever issues they need to raise, they have quite a strong parliamentary team they could have used to discuss these things robustly in parliament, to try and say, this is what we are suggesting, this is the way we want to look at it. And then, we, and then Kenyans have this conversation. But what is happening in the streets right now is, is really not helping anyone. It's making things worse for the Kenyan economy. It's making things worse for even the protesters themselves because nothing is getting accomplished by, you know, the violence that we are seeing in the streets. Doctor, the way you are putting it, you know, things are escalating now. Protests have also been reported in Kenya's Kisumu, Kisi and Migori counties. In Kibera, yeah, yeah. stronghold of the opposition, the protests have yeah. turned violent. And even Kenya's Ministry of Education has announced that all primary and secondary schools in Nairobi and the coastal city yeah. of uh, Mombasa are to close. Yeah. In my view, uh, Raila Odinga is just capitalizing on a hard situation to try and make things hard for the government. Even if he was the one in power, things would still be as thick or as bad as they are right now. So, in my view, they have opted the route of economic sabotage, which for me does not really help the economy, does not help the country. That was Dr. Edgar Githua, an international relations security and diplomacy expert at the United States International University in Nairobi. Ruto inherited a battered economy, grappling with soaring inflation, a high debt burden, unemployment, and post-COVID stagnation. The new finance uh, bill imposes taxes that Ruto says will help create jobs and increase domestic revenue. Organizers of the Women Deliver Conference on Spaces, Solidarity and Solutions say about 6,000 people showed up in person with tens of thousands attending online. Corporate lawyer turned entrepreneur Monica Musondo is CEO and founder of Java Foods, a Zambian-based food processing company. Musondo talks with VOA's Carol Van Dam. We're really happy, first of all, that it's been held on the African continent and has been able to bring women from all, of, all over the world and also all spheres, uh, spheres of influence. So you're, you, you have NGOs, you have women in business, you have government officials all here discussing how we can uh, further enhance women equality, uh, issues related to women in business, how we can really enhance policy and things of that nature.
tell us a little about Java Foods. And I know you're a, you were a corporate lawyer and now you're an entrepreneur. So how did that all come about? Sure. So I, I, I'm a, a trained corporate lawyer, had, wor- had worked for 16 years all across the world, advising corporates on various things. And I'm from originally from Zambia, and it really dawned on me towards the end of my career that I actually was not doing something in my own country. And I really asked myself the question whether I wanted to continue to impact my country through law or would it be something else? And when I visited, I realized that actually we needed a probably a lot more support in manufacturing, in particular in food processing, where we found on shelf a lot of times a lot of imported products. And for me, what was front and center coming from Zambia was that uh, Zambia grew food very well. Uh, yields on a year-on-year basis were very strong, but we didn't process it. So we didn't put it in a packaged form for the consumer to buy. And there I saw an opportunity to really create products uh, which were made from locally sourced raw materials, uh, packaged very well at an affordable price point for a Zambian and a regional consumer. And that's where the business idea came from. I think a lot of people can take hope from you because I think that's that's the situation with a lot of countries in Africa where they have the, the raw materials and they have the food. They just don't have the, the manufacturing. That's absolutely right. Uh, so it's not unique a unique issue for Zambia. And in fact, you'll see uh, coming out of COVID and the, this uh, crisis in Ukraine, that now we've been really highly impacted because imports were now becoming really more expensive. And the crisis was now becoming a food crisis very quickly. And therefore, the need and the discussion of governments to speak to business to say, how can we actually produce more locally um, local foods for our people, which are much more affordable? So sometimes in crisis, there's a silver lining in everything. And I think that the conversations are now much are picking up and I'm being much more inclusive. And that's why you see me as a, a CEO of Java Foods still being here because of really strong focus towards um, more food production in our in our own countries. Talk about being a woman CEO in, in your country. And did you face obstacles in getting your company off the ground? So, yeah, I think I did. I mean, obviously, in a, an industry which is not used to seeing uh, women running a business, coming up with a business idea, putting a team together and growing a business, uh, um, manufacturing all across the continent is really dominated by multinationals or by men, simply simply put. So a bit, I was a bit unusual. And oftentimes people didn't take you seriously. So access to market was very difficult. Um, they, a lot of people figured that I wouldn't be around. So why waste your time on me? Um, I didn't really know what, what I was doing. And sometimes they were right. I mean, very early on, you were still feeling the ground and trying to figure out how to get product to market, how to price it. But I'm no different from a man who would start out the business, right? But definitely the, 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 the critical aspects were that at the time, although I was quite a qualified lawyer with many, many years of experience, people weren't willing to bank on this new business in a new sector in an area which were, they, they were used to seeing other people. So raising finance was very difficult for me. I had to use personal money to grow the business. And it took a few years. I actually think it took a lot longer than it should have to actually grow the business because it was just that much harder. What do you hope to do to help other women achieve the kinds of things that you've already been able to do? So actually, I I do a lot of things. And I think it's great platforms like this to speak to you about what what I've done, but also going to conferences like uh, We Deliver, but also being a part of what we call AFAWA, which is under the African Development Bank, which is a group of women uh, women entrepreneurs and ambassadors who are now speaking using our voice and their platform to tell women across the continent our journeys to to come together to, to discuss innovative ideas. Because today, actually, we cannot say you shouldn't finance women run businesses because because they have been actually successful. And with that, we wrap up this edition of African News Tonight. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in Washington. 